Okay, cool. All right, well, it's three o'clock. Might as well get started. Um, I'm Andy Hahn. Uh, I've been doing some consulting work for Pratt & Whitney for about the last year. And unfortunately, because of COVID, I'm no longer doing that. But um, I was actually given the chance to do some pretty outstanding uh, design work, both conventional and unconventional configurations, mostly airliners. And I thought that it would be really good to give back to the uh, community with some of the things that I had learned uh, from, you know, reality wonking me upside the head. Uh, basically, the idea was we were going to do a lot of CFD analysis to show that a particular engine installation had some uh, transonic drag benefits. In order to do that, we had to do uh, many, many, many iterations of CFD and using CAD just did not seem like it was going to be very productive. So uh, what I did was I introduced them to OpenVSP and assured them that it would be able to do the job. And um, actually we were very pleased with the performance that we had with the progress that we made. And, and I think I even surprised myself with the flexibility of uh, OpenVSP. Uh, a little bit later, I'll get into what I think the pros and cons are compared to something like CAD. Just to start off, I always like to do this. Uh, this is Andy's design philosophy, and um, I like to quote George E.P. Box, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And what that basically means is whatever you're working with is not going to be a perfect representation of reality, but sometimes good enough is good enough. Um, the one thing that frustrates me tremendously, particularly with managers, is order and fidelity are not the same thing. Order is the number of degrees of freedom a model can account for, and fidelity is the measure of its ability to reproduce data or reality correctly. And oddly enough, sometimes the low order model is the high fidelity method. Um, it's very hard to convince managers of that when they've made very large investments in things like NX or uh, CFD, that that might not be the best tools for the job. Uh, and so usually what I try to do is show them that you should use the lowest order method that can actually do the job at hand. Um, in our case, actually, because we were doing transonic uh, airliner aerodynamics, we really did have to go to CFD pretty much. Um, and then, of course, don't be too proud of this technological terror you've constructed, which is Darth Vader. And I always like to poke fun a little bit at the CFD guys because, you know, they actually have quite a bit of faith in their tools. And I think um, you really need to understand them and, and maybe take what they say with a grain of salt. And then, of course, avoid copyright infringement and wasting toner. So this presentation will not be as pretty as some of the ones that you've seen but hopefully the information is what's important. So fidelity is a loaded term. Uh, basically the definition is, it's the degree of exactness with which something is copied or reproduced. And if you're actually doing your design in open VSP, then the geometry is definitive and therefore is the highest fidelity possible. And in fact, a lot of the advanced work that I was doing, the open VSP geometry was the only uh, geometry. Uh, if you're going to build a model in OpenVSP that was defined somewhere else, it's going to introduce errors. The only real question being to what degree and will it really matter? And of course that depends on the accuracy of the source geometry and the skill of the modeler, basically. Uh, in our case, in the progress uh, program that we were working, um, we were very lucky to have excellent uh, source geometry as well as test data. So that was really cool. Um, and even CAD is not perfect. In fact, the source geometry that I had was CAD and it wasn't really any easier to perform the analysis on. It had issues. It always required manual manipulation of the geometry. And quite frankly, uh, because of problems with the geometry, uh, it introduced things into the flow solutions that were not actually there on the real vehicle. So, you know, CAD isn't perfect, uh, VSP is not perfect, 
But, you know, I think once again, people are too proud of the technological terror that they've created. Um, and they kind of poo poo the parameter based uh, layout of VSP because it's just not as flexible. So what was what were we actually working on? Well, we were actually working on a uh, advanced engine installation. But in order to prove that that installation actually uh, did what I said it was going to do, we had to have essentially an unassailable baseline um, that you know, we could show that our tools and methodology were reproducing as good of reality as could possibly be done with those tools. And that then any uh, analysis done in the same way on the same class of vehicle under the same conditions, you could actually believe. And so what we did was we looked at the NASA and Pratt and Whitney uh, had done a joint engine installation wind tunnel test in the mid 80s. Uh, luckily, the my partner in crime, uh, Bob Malecki, actually ran that test, so he had really excellent uh, access to everything that he possibly have wanted. Um, the geometry is actually still relevant today. It's not quite as advanced as, say, the newest A320neo, but it is one step behind. Uh, it's actually uh, still quite relevant, even though it was done in the 80s. Um, and because Pratt had designed, built, and tested the model, we had everything we could possibly have asked for in order to essentially reproduce that. And, uh, you know, this really allowed for creating an extremely high fidelity open VSP model from the CAD. So we not only had direct surface comparisons, we also had flow solution comparisons. And so it, it was really neat. We had a CAD wind tunnel model that was actually run in the wind tunnel and we could take that exact same CAD that was designed you know used to build the model and run it through the CFD in this case we use star CCM plus and compare those two to each other in order to directly understand what issues there might be uh, in the CFD um, we and and then basically I was then able to take that CAD using the fit model capability in, C in VSP and reproduce that uh, geometry as close as physically possible given the constraints of the parameters which I had chosen uh, to implement. So it was really neat. I mean, we learned about the pros and cons of CAD and open VSP. Uh, you know, CAD is extremely flexible. You can almost anything you can think of, you can do. It might be a little difficult, but you can do it. Whereas OpenVSP is kind of constrained by parameterization. It's not as constrained as you would think though. Um, and, and so one of the things I wanted to show is I have some fairly unusual shapes uh, that are actual real shapes on the engine nacelle. And um, it's kind of shocking how little you need to do in order to recreate them. Um, and one of the real advantages though, is that OpenVSP, it was easier to produce watertight fair surfaces and importing those surfaces into uh, Star CCM Plus through the stereolithography uh, STL file export was very robust. Uh, it, it, there was very little manual uh, patching that needed to be done and many of the original issues that we had uh, discovered, we just kind of came up with workarounds. And uh, as long as I built the models in a certain way, a lot of that handwork actually went away all on its own. So that was actually pretty cool. Uh, Star CCM Plus, when it imports those STLs and then regrids, um, it's actually pretty robust. Uh, it has some good tools for filtering and stuff like that. So it's actually pretty cool. And of course, we learned about the pros and cons of wind tunnels versus CFD, which is actually crucial in interpreting our results for the advanced uh, geometries. So uh, we just accepted the wind tunnel data as truth. Um, we learned where the CFD was, uh, you know, trustworthy, where it started to break down, and what open VSP model features promoted easy importation as well as stable convergence. So if you Convergences for some reason 
you know, your compute times go way up or may never actually complete. Uh, so it's kind of important that you build your model in a way that helps that out. So uh, in this talk, unfortunately, I can't actually share the NASA Pratt EET model, um, even though there is nothing sensitive or proprietary about the model itself, because uh, it was a NASA sponsored test. I believe that somewhere in, you know, next to the lost arc, there probably is that information. And, uh, you know, you could probably get that through other channels, but because all of the work that I did was under Pratt um, developmental money, basically all that work is uh, owned by Pratt. So I can't actually share that, but what I can share is the process that we went through, some of the unexpected problems and the little tips and tricks that we learned along the way to try to overcome them. Uh, in the case of the EET model, I actually had CAD and uh, this first part of the talk is just going to explain what I did with that. Uh, how was it useful? The second part is a little bit more of a traditional demonstrative uh, showing of modeling tips, tricks, and lessons learned. Um, I will actually try to attempt to uh, manipulate things in OpenVSP real time just to see how that works, depending on time and, um, and stability. We'll see how that goes. Um, and the one thing I have to make absolutely clear is there is no proprietary or sensitive data in this presentation. What few sources I did use were from the open literature. And uh, quite frankly, it, this model, even though I used, say, a cutaway uh, of the Pratt, uh, you know, geared turbofan engine, I know what that geared turbofan engine actually looks like. And the cutaway that I used was considerably altered. So no one should take anything in this model or this presentation as uh, being definitive or uh, very accurate. We're really looking at just what are the pieces parts and how did I use them in order to create a model that actually produced excellent uh, correlation with the both the wind tunnel test uh, data and the CAD generated CFD data. So the first thing is, is if you actually have CAD, uh, you can try to do a hand fit of it, but uh, one of the things that Rob put in was the fit model. And if you can get it to work, it's freaking awesome. It is an amazing tool. It's really cool. Um, but unfortunately for me, at first, I couldn't get it to work at all. And in fact, it was a little frustrating because I would set up a problem and it would just go away for a half an hour or even longer sometimes, sometimes hours, and then eventually just crash open VSP. And I, I had gotten no further than when I started. So, uh, you know, I went back to Rob's tutorial and it worked just fine. And so I'm kind of thinking, okay, what's different about what I'm doing and, you know, what Rob had demonstrated? So after quite a bit of uh, navel gazing, I noticed that the STLs that my CAD guy gave me were extremely high resolution. And uh, it was also monolithic. Basically, he just had the outer mold line of the uh, entire engine pod and just exported an STL of the whole thing. And that turned out to be a terrible idea. Uh, for multiple reasons. So like the first tip I would give is uh, if you can, like I actually did learn a little bit of NX, basically go in there and, you know, like trim out things that you don't need, segregate things that you're, you know, pieces, parts that you're going to want to fit individually, and then de-res the uh, settings for the STL output. Uh, he was giving me, you know, models that had something like 60,000 points on them. And I did a little sensitivity and anything above about 2,000 points would crash open VSP and it didn't get, it made no progress in, in the process. So um, I made a concerted effort to keep the number of points below 1,500 lower 
is even better, but I wouldn't go much higher than 1500. It just really starts to bog down and the stability starts to suffer. And, you know, that's okay. Because remember, we're not printing the geometry, we're fitting it. And what we need is a representative sample of points that lie on the surface for uh, the fit model to do essentially an optimization, minimizing the error between the two surfaces. So it's uh, actually, like in so many cases with OpenVSP, less is more. So uh, when you actually do get, uh, say for instance, I started out with just the inlet um, surface, and it was relatively small number of points, and I didn't have to choose, you know, uh, through the interactive uh, point chooser that Rob had implemented. I just literally imported all points and it was just fine. Um, you know, the temptation is to give it every possible uh, parameter necessary that you think might actually fit the model and then hit the big red button and hope that something comes out. Uh, generally speaking, that does not work very well. Uh, so my suggestion is to do your best to fit the geometry by hand. Um, basically, just treat it like you don't have the fit model available to you. And that'll do two things for you. It reduces the chance that the optimizer will find a poor local minimum and just stick there. Or in some of the more hilarious cases, it'll find an air quotes, unintuitive solution, which is completely bonkers. And of course, once that happens, unless you had saved uh, previous uh, geometry, uh, basically your work is gone. So, uh, you know, what I do is I start out with only a few design variables, adding new variables as I need them, and then letting the optimizer kind of choose the best combination at each stage. It does, I don't, delete variables because sometimes things that you do downstream will affect things that you had already done upstream and it would you know in order to get a better fit you would definitely want to have it re-examine these earlier uh, parameters so I tend to just grow the number of parameters but of course hopefully I'm refining more than I'm making any major changes and so it works stably and relatively quickly. So if you're going to get started uh, on a just a normal uh, hand generation of a model, particularly when I'm doing engine pods, I will get a blank component and I will call the blank component something assembly. And in this case, because I'm doing an engine pod, I'll do an engine pod assembly. And the, you know the reason for that is that you know, you can make children of, say, the duct. But I have found that over time, things just get a little too cumbersome when you do that. And so what I tend to do is have the same origin coordinate system in the blank that I use for uh, the duct. And I'll, I'll actually explain why I chose what I chose. Um, and then attach everything to that unless it makes sense to attach to one of the subcomponents. And what this does is it allows for very convenient and, and simple translation and rotation of a whole engine pod as a unit. And that is actually very helpful when you're doing sensitivity studies. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of um, give you a flavor of what these things are. I, you know, when I agreed to do this thing, I wasn't entirely certain what to do or how to do it. And so I almost created a tutorial on how to do this modeling. Um, I did not actually do a tutorial on how to fit the model because uh, I don't have the original geometry for one thing. But um, I do explain how you would take what we're generating here and what you would do with it in the fit model, along with several tips and tricks about features that you might want to build into the model to start with. So 
uh, I, I'm just going to go through this first one kind of pedantically, and then we're going to start skipping over these because they're all very similar, uh, you know, page after page after page. There's no point in belaboring it all. In fact, uh, I, my hope is that if you just follow these instructions from scratch, you will wind up with a component that essentially, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to generate here. So in this case, this is a duct model. I like to start with the duct, uh, not only because it's obviously the, the biggest thing there, but um, it's sort of the thing that everything else indexes to. And one of the more interesting things is you can start the duct at the highlight. It, it's a perfectly reasonable and rational uh, choice, and that's what I used to do. But after having to do several of these things for an engine company, the one thing I realized was the only thing that doesn't really change on the engine is the fan diameter. <laughs> Everything else can. And so the first thing I do is I make cross section zero my reference at the fan location. And it is the inside of the duct. And I choose the diameter. Oops, how did that happen? Uh, I choose the diameter to be the fan diameter, and that is the one thing that is never going to change from that point on. Uh, then I go and I make the first cross section, the inlet highlight. And in this case, one of the weirder things is the X dimension on this component is a minus. Now, if you choose something like a fuselage component, the first thing you'll notice is you cannot do that. Um, if you choose a uh, stack, you cannot do that. But if you do a stack and choose the um, loop option, you can. And this was something that was introduced specifically to do duct type geometries way, way, way back. But uh, this particular implementation with the looped uh, stack is perfect for this sort of application. So by going to a uh, minus uh, delta x, essentially now I've moved to the left of zero, which is kind of a weird thing in relation to almost all the other geometries out there. And then what I do is I just go and take each successive cross section and kind of loop back on itself to the trailing edge so, you know, we'll get down here to like, uh, you know, uh, this is the maximum or uh, the exit outer diameter. We're sort of at the uh, where you would think that the nozzle would come out uh, or the exit for the nozzle is. And then I, uh, if you just follow these directions, you just insert a cross section, do these parameters. Um, you can create a blunt trailing edge. And that's kind of the first tip is that when we were doing sharp trailing edges on almost anything that might generate any kind of circulation, Star CCM had a very difficult time dealing with that. And oftentimes the convergences were not only poor, but sometimes were not even going to happen. It was just chewing up a lot of uh, cycle time for no apparent reason. So. The first thing I do is I create essentially the same, I just, you know, insert a cross section. It is the same cross section, just displaced downwind. And then I go and I uh, make X is zero. So now it's lying on top of itself. I subtract 0.04, and in this case, I'm doing feet um, in order to uh, create that uh, sharp step, the bluntness. And then the first thing I'll do then is go into the off, uh, go into the parameter link uh, tool set and create an offset between uh, cross section three and cross section four. And the reason for that is, is that if I ever change the diameter at cross section three, it will maintain that uh, 0.04 uh, offset and keep the bluntness. It'll just track uh, in tandem. And like I said, the reason that we did that was we found that the blunt edges helped with the CFD convergence. Also, if Bob for some reason needed to uh, create a uh, boundary condition, 
uh, having a nice sharp corner there made it very easy to either detect automagically within uh, star CCM plus, but also the other thing that I started to do was to create subsurfaces keyed on those edges so that he could then get um, separated surfaces that he could then tag. So uh, let's see. So we're going to insert another cross section, move that upwind. Notice it's a minus 3.7. Uh, so now we're moving from the uh, nozzle back into the duct. And uh, then uh, if you actually look at what this thing looks like, uh, it's pretty messed up. It, it, you know, even if you typed in these values exactly, what you have does not look like a duct. Um, that's because we've only done the cross sections and uh, next we're going to go ahead and do the uh, um, uh, surfacing. Uh, so where did I get all of these values? I measured them off a drawing and uh, just kind of typed them in. I, I didn't do the typical thing where you go and you put a background up against uh, VSP and uh, try to match those things by eye. And uh, generally speaking, I, I just prefer to do it this way. I then check to see how well that looks when I do actually put the background up against VSP, and I'll show you some of those. OK, uh, so yeah, like I said, it looks like a mess, but we're going to fix it. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do the skidding. And if the here's a kind of another tip. If the duck is axisymmetric, you'll notice that the default in VSP is that the uh, skin cross sections are not all sim. So the first thing I do is for all the cross sections I have at the time, I just go through and just set them all back to all sim. Um, even if the duct is not axisymmetric, and this one is not, uh, this is actually a really good thing to do at the start. It'll save you so much time because generally speaking, things are mostly axisymmetric and you only have to undo uh, the parts that you need to undo at that point. So this is just, a, a, in general for me, this is just the first thing I do. So then I go through and I uh, try to match angles. And in this case, I really do use the uh, background because that's something that's harder to measure off the drawing. Um, I just try to eyeball match whatever angles there might be. And then, of course, the strengths, uh, they're very much open to interpretation. So you can go through all of these numbers. You'll generate the duct um, that I'm going to show in a minute. And the question is, where did I get all of these values? And basically, I just put the background screen up, scaled and located uh, the cross sections because obviously the cross sections have an absolute you know, engineering value. And then I just change the scale so that it actually fits a known diameter on the uh, background screen and locate it and then run through the process to try to determine what all of these values should be. Uh, and it looks a, a lot better, but we can do a little bit of refining still. Uh, in fact, I'm just gonna, uh, I'll, I'll take it in turn. Um, the refining part is where I realized that the upper and lower parts of the duct were not the, the same everywhere. So even though it's left-right symmetric, it's not up-down symmetric. So the first thing you need to do is you need to go through and deselect the symmetries that you know we had not actually uh, already you know set. But in this case, it's only in a few places. And you can go ahead and run through these things and, um, you know, go ahead and retweak your angles and your uh, strengths. But here's one of the things that I kind of ran across is that by doing this, because there's that thin trailing edge, one thing that you have to be careful of is that you don't have the inner and outer surfaces intersect each other. And this is going to happen. It, it's potentially going to happen anytime you have a very thin, uh, you know, trailing edge or something like that. And then, uh, you know, when I did the the bottom, 
I basically just repeated the process in just a couple of places. So what does that look like? It basically looks like this. Um, one of the other things that I, I kind of thought would be a good idea at some point was the feature lines on VSP are black and the drawing lines are black. And so if I had to do this over again, I would actually change the color of the drawing to something not black to make it a whole lot easier to see that the feature lines were actually falling on the cross sections that I knew. So now that we have your typical VSP duct, um, what do you do to make it compatible for CFD? And you know, the first thing is that the blunt fan trailing edge was a good start. We absolutely needed to do that. But one of the other things that we can do is define subsurfaces. And you know, this turns out to be a really useful feature because they're used to separate the surface regions for purposes of integration of forces and for applying boundary conditions. And what I did was I just worked closely with Bob and asked him, you know, what is it that you want from me? I will build that into the model. And because of the way they're defined, generally speaking, even as the model morphed around, these uh, subsurfaces tended to stay where they needed to stay, which is actually kind of cool. So uh, if you go into the model, which I will upload to the uh, hangar, so you can take a look at it in detail, uh, and you look, you will actually find uh, those subsurfaces. And so what I did was I did the outer trailing edge, the highlight, and the inner trailing edge. And the outer trailing edge and inner trailing edges were uh, defining essentially the, the flat part of the trailing edge, which he applied a boundary condition to. And then the highlight was the demarcation between interior and exterior flow. So the way he does his bookkeeping, he really wanted to know uh, roughly uh, within some reasonable value uh, you know, what part of the surfaces that were being scrubbed by the air were considered part of the airframe and what parts were being con still considered part of the engine. So it's a, it's a bookkeeping thing. And then, of course, uh, you know, we found that the most robust way to get geometry back and forth was through uh, exporting stereolithography uh, files. And they are, you know, resolution dependent. And so what I did was I just kind of worked with him over an iterative process to find out what was a good balance between uh, having enough resolution to where the model was accurate uh, for gridding, but not so overly populated that uh, either the triangles would get ridiculously small and we ran it. And we did actually, in some instances, run into situations where uh, the triangles would, uh, when they were read in to NX, uh, I mean, well, both NX and star CCM, uh, there must have been some sort of round off error or something because some of them became degenerate. And, you know, so higher resolution isn't always the best choice anyways, even for accuracy, but it, it did create some problems with, uh, you know, our ability to actually do the analysis in an efficient way. And so we've had the question <clears throat> when you use the uh, STL out of VSP and take took that into star CCM, did you use that for the surface mesh or did you then regenerate a new surface mesh around that STL? We regenerated the surface mesh because clearly the triangulation of the STL is not high quality. Um, but one of the things that we were pleasantly surprised about star was it really seems they, they it seems like they really worked hard to make it easy for you to import uh something like an stl which is clearly not usable for cfd and remesh really easily uh, and also there actually are relatively simple tools in star that allow you to do things like delete triangles and patch over holes and things like that so when we ran into situations where we did have small degenerate areas. Um, Bob was actually relatively easily able to, you know, filter out those degenerations and then 
just one by one go in there by hand and patch them so that then star could do its thing with generating the new grid and and that worked really really well actually we were pleasantly surprised i i've never used star even to this day bob was new to star and uh he was able to do some really really good work i i, I was really impressed thanks for asking that we had one other question while we're there <clears throat> why did you use subsurfaces for the blunt trailing edge when there were already hard cross sections there so the lines were already in present without the subsurfaces what did uh, using subsurfaces get for you okay so if you have those uh the the way the thing comes out is all of the triangles on the duct would be tagged with the same ID number. When you use the subsurfaces, uh, you know, to essentially not cut the geometry, it's still all one piece. But what you're kind of telling uh, during the export is if you have, you know, a, a boundary like the subsurface boundary, anything above that or below that is essentially a new ID number. And so by uh, putting a line uh, subsurface uh, at each corner of that blunt trailing edge, I was able to essentially segregate, you know, what was what was on the trailing edge and what was off the trailing edge. And so the triangles that came out that were on the trailing edge itself had a different number than the neighboring triangles across that line. And that allowed Bob to then uh, apply a boundary condition to just those triangles. But the geometry is still all one piece. It, it's just a, sort of like a bookkeeping thing. So that's what it looks like. I showed you that before. Now I'm gonna try to go a little bit faster. Um, oh, well, let's talk about the fit model. I'm not going to do a demonstration of the fit model because I don't have the CAD, but uh, this is what I learned. And it is if you have CAD to match to, what we just generated is what I would start the fit model from. And, you know, it helps to go through that process because by my choosing the design variables necessary to create that starting point, I now know what design variables the fit model has to work with. And, you know, it, it just helps you to encapsulate in your mind how to set up the optimization. Um, and the one thing I would say is, you know, don't give it all of them. In fact, there may be reasons for you to not give it certain ones on purpose. Like, I don't want it to change the diameter, at, you know, where the fan was. I, I definitely want that one to stay what it is. Um, but, you know, typically what I do is I will have it work with uh, cross-section diameters, uh, slope, tangent slopes, and uh, the strengths uh, of the um, Bezier curves. And sometimes it will do things that I did not expect that produce better results than I would have gotten just using my standard methodology. So it will come up with somewhat non-intuitive solutions that I would have never tried, and um, they are clearly better. So th this is really kind of a, a really great tool. Um, it, it produced extremely accurate uh, geometry if you do it right. Uh, within the constraints of the parameters that you've chosen. And in fact, one of the funnier things was uh, CAD, it's very hard to have a, a fair surface um, using typical CAD techniques. And, uh, and VSP, it's actually harder to get a non-fair than a fair. You have to go out of your way to make it you know, unfair. And so when we looked at the CFD results that we got from the CAD model and the CFD results from my matched uh, VSP model, we could see bands of color on the CAD model indicating that there was higher order ringing in that surface and the analysis was actually picking it up. And the uh, VSP was just beautiful. It, it really was just beautiful. Uh, it, you know, in the end, did it really affect 
our integrated lift and drag and among other things nah, not really i mean you know within a count or two um but still it, it was good to see that you know vsp is really good at what it does um so when i did do the fit like i said i would have pieces of the hole already split out turned into stls of reduced you know, point density. And that meant that I didn't have to keep messing with, you know, using the interactive segregation of points to be considered for the optimizer. It turns out that it's so much easier to just do it that way and just import all of them and, and don't worry about it. Uh, and that did take some upfront prep work. So I, I actually did learn enough NX to be able to do that and um, got exactly what I wanted, and it worked beautifully. And you know, the key here is, is that we're not asking the fit model to do some heroic design task. We're, we're just asking it, hey, I, I got a design here. Can you, you know, polish it a little bit for me? That, that's basically what I was doing. So I'm gonna skip through these really quickly, but basically you kind of repeat that process for the core so, you know, you, you basically do the cross sections first. It's a mess. Um, oh, and, and there's many more cross sections in this case. Um, where did I get the values? I measured them off the drawing again. And the drawing appeared to have a top bottom asymmetry that actually I don't believe was actually supposed to be there. So I just ignored it, um, whereas I did not ignore it on the nacelle. And then, uh, as before, you know, I clean the mess that you see, uh, you know, by doing the skinning. The skinning is a lot more, it's, it's a lot more of the same. It's not particularly difficult. Once you kind of get into the, the way things work, it, it, you kind of get used to it. But, uh, you know, it's just more of the same. So, tip, uh, if the spinner starts at a sharp point, because we uh, on this model, we actually had a conical spinner. Um, it's really best to blunt it with a small diameter hemisphere. If you have that thing go into a sharp point on a cone, it caused us no end of issues exporting the STL triangles and having a uh, star read them in. But once I just said, you know, screw it, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to put a little hemisphere of, I think it was like a, a one inch diameter and then it, the spinner was perfect after that. Um, we never had another problem. So it was just a really good thing to do. Um, yeah, so like I said, it's just more of the same. So there's this other thing. Uh, I call it the fan puck. Uh, it is not a model of the fan. It's basically something that stands in for the fan during the analysis. And it's used solely to provide boundary conditions. It regulates the mass flow through the engine and the thrust simulation. It also masks the details of the fan core split internally. And when I show you a, a picture of this thing, you'll understand what I mean. Um, it's relatively simple, but it is so important. Um, so basically, I just run through the same kind of thing. But here we have a little bit of a tip. The natural tendency is because you think this is the fan, to make the fan the same diameter, uh, 81 inches, and I think that's a typo. I think it's like six and a half inches or something, or six and a half feet, whatever it is. Um, you know, the natural tendency is for you to just type in the diameter of the fan, and that's actually a very bad idea. Uh, the reason for that is, is that we've already set the duct inner diameter to that correct value, and I gotta, it's a typo. I gotta figure out what that actual value is. Um, and having two surfaces occupying the same space is ambiguous. The, it will completely confuse the uh, intersection routine. And on top of that, if you're, uh, I forget if it's U or W, but one of those tessellations, if those are not the same, the vertices for each of those things will not lie on top of each other, even if everything else is perfect. And what it does is it opens up gaps all over the place um, and you get very, very strange results. So it is much better practice to give a generous overlap and let open VSPs intersection routines to find the actual intersection. It's, a, it's, 
it'll save you a lot of pain and suffering. Um, once again, when you do the cross sections, you're, uh, it looks like a mess. You got to go through the skinning. Um, now, one of the things that I tend to do is set the left and right angles um, in order to make those sharp 90 degree turns by having a discontinuity between the left and right. Um, you can do that. It does work fine, but Rob suggested to me some time back, and, and actually I think this is a good idea. If you're going to have something like that, it's really a good idea to just deselect the set for the skin cross sections. And in this case, because all of them are like 90 degree angles, they're, they're all discontinuous, you might as well just do it for all of them. And it just produces a very uh, robust, simple surface that you know the rest of VSP deals with very nicely. And there is no need to define subsurface here because the intersections, which is different from that trailing edge on the nacelle, uh, where there was no actual intersection, it was just a 90 degree corner. Here, there's going to be intersections between the inner wall of the nacelle and this fan puck. And those will automatically uh, be tagged with different values. And so there's no need to set any of the subsurfaces here. And this is what that looks like. And uh, it's pretty obvious that you can see that I have buried a big, you know, generous amount of that fan puck inside of what would be the duct. Um, here, uh, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but this inlet portion right here, which takes the core air after it's gone through the fan, Bob just didn't even want to mess with this. So what I did was, I just made the fan puck really deep and whatever happens in here don't matter. So it greatly simplified uh, his side of the business and it produced perfectly good results. It, it was not a problem. So that's kind of another tip is, you know, don't bother with, you know, simulating things that you don't got to simulate. But this rear nozzle here is all modeled and so uh here what i do is i do a whole bunch of uh subsurface uh, definitions in order to make sure that these surfaces are taggable so he can set his boundary conditions there i'm gonna have to kind of pick up the pace on this thing um bifurcator modeling this actually the model that i'm going to give you is nothing like the real thing I was shocked at how complicated the bifurcators are. Crazy complicated. I'm just doing something nice and simple. Um, it probably would actually be just fine if you don't have the CAD geometry or the real design. There's not much you can do about simulating it. You might as well just do what I'm doing here. And so um, the one thing that is a very helpful tip is on section four, and I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. Um, basically, I knew the leading edge sweep. I knew the trailing edge sweep. I didn't necessarily know the cord uh, tip and, uh, and root cord. So uh, I wanted to let VSP do the work for me. I just basically selected uh, you know, a secondary sweep of 40 degrees on the trailing edge. But if you leave that like that, in the past, I have found that if you make changes nearby or on that uh, panel, weird things will happen. And so just as a matter of you know, process, I immediately will reselect the tip cord because it's calculated what the tip cord has to be to make that true. I just reselect the tip cord and from that point on, that tip cord will not change unless I change it. That is not true if you do if you leave the secondary sweep uh, in control. Um, okay, yeah, and I basically said this. The bifurcator is just much more complex than you could imagine. So this is what it looks like. Unfortunately, the um, drawing that I'm using, even though it actually had the location for the leading edge, it did not have the rest of the uh, bifurcator. So it's off the screen, but when I show you the full up thing, you'll, you'll see it.
So pylon, kind of more of the same. In this case, though, the pylon is actually pretty complicated. And so there's a lot of little steps and a lot of little things you got to do. And what does it look like? It kind of looks like a, a streamlined slug. And that streamlined slug intersects, obviously, the main duct as well as the bifurcator. Here's some things that initially kind of stymied me, and uh, I was kind of proud that I was able to produce some pretty darn good representations. And these are the upper and lower thrust reverser fairing models. And once again, just follow these directions, and hopefully it's a step-by-step -step of how you get to this thing. And because this is such an odd shape, I, I kind of want to show it. So let's see if I can get out of this real quick. And so this is what the entire geometry looks like all knitted together. But I'm going to go ahead and just only show, say, the upper. So let's show only. Let's zoom in so you can see it better. And this only has four cross sections in it. And the only reason it has four cross sections is, remember how I said we tend to have blunt trailing edges to enhance uh you know convergence i had to essentially you know trim the end off of this thing and give it a nice blunt trailing edge otherwise the cfd was not doing a very good job of converging but once i did that actually it worked beautifully and this <laughs> this took some head scratching to be able to do but uh, particularly once I had the CAD geometry of this thing, at least the outer wetted surface, it was able to do a really good parameter choice to reproduce this thing. The lower, is kind of a similar beast, but actually even more complicated. And yet, it still, I believe, only has four cross sections. Yeah, I mean, if you count zero as one, there are five cross sections in there. The reason that there are that many cross sections is because, once again, it has a blunt trailing edge to promote CFD convergence. And then, when it takes a fair amount of trial and error to fit these things together in a way that, you know, it's not stupid, but Let's go ahead and show what it looks like on the duct. So much of that is actually buried. And it's kind of like whatever's inside of here, I don't care. Um, I only care about uh, how it interfaces here at the trailing edge, as well as whether or not it faithfully reproduces the outer mold line of the original. And I was able to actually do a really good job of that on the model that we generated. So I, I was particularly proud of that. Um, so the point where Bob actually said, holy smokes, we might want to start defining these things in VSP when we're designing them, uh, just because he, he saw how flexible uh, the geometry was when we wanted to make changes. So that was actually pretty cool. Okay, so we'll skip that, skip that. Oh, okay, well, we're essentially at the end anyways. I obviously, uh, people who know me know that I always misjudge how long it's gonna take to do something. And so I had intended to have this actually on an airplane, uh, but apparently three days to build a model from scratch and pr produce a presentation. It's not enough. So uh, this is how far I got. I actually intend to go ahead and finish the rest of the model with the airplane because I think how it interfaces with the wing is also important. Um, it turns out that you can spend much of your design budget just on making the pylon not terrible. So, um, you know, it turns out that that's a, a major issue as well. But this is a really good start for anyone who wants to do a high fidelity uh, CFD analysis of a 
engine with propulsion effects. Um, and actually, I, I forgot to point out, this line right here is yet another subsurface. And I put that in place because once again, Bob wanted to be able to integrate forces on the surfaces and know what was in and what was out. So um, everything below that line was considered you know, flow from the engine and everything above that line was considered part of the airframe. And that just was a really convenient way for him to do his force integrations. So with that, uh, I guess we have like five minutes left if anybody has any questions. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Andy. Let's see if any questions come up on the um, on the group. I've asked a couple of them to you along the way. Um, yeah, I think kind of circling back to the question about using the STL kind of as the guide. Uh, how dense was that STL that you brought out into Star CCM? And do you know if um, they? you know, Star CCM was kind of interpolating those curves to make a, a fair surface, or if you had a pretty high res STL at the beginning and then let it kind of grow onto those surfaces. Yeah, so um, this was kind of trial and error because obviously there's good points and bad points about having higher and higher resolution. Um, what we sort of decided, and let's go ahead and select all, and in this case I'm doing hidden, this is essentially the the grid density of the STL. You know, every single place where those there you see two lines cross, that's a node, and then it's just going to lay in diagonals and create a triangle there. Um, it was able to essentially do curve patches through those nodes, and obviously, if we had a lot of change in the geometry like up here at the you know uh, high uh, low radius of curvature or some people call it high curvature area clearly you want to have more density and one of the nice things about vsp is it generally does the right thing even without you trying there are uh you do have little things that you can tweak to change how it distributes points um you could hit this thing with ridiculous resolution, but the problem there becomes uh, when you start getting into very small things like this trailing edge, if you have extremely high resolution, once again, you start to have triangles that become degenerate and it's probably not a very good idea. Um, I did not do the CFD, so I'm not entirely certain how star mechanically used them and that would that would be a question for someone who actually knows how to run star thanks andy andy um i think i know the answer to this but do you know if there's um uh, any possibility that you'll be able to, to publish or share more about your crap work in the future well, considering I've been laid off, <laughs> um, you know, that that's a, I would love to, I absolutely would love to, because it will knock your socks off. It, you know, that overwing the cell thing that I've been talking about since 1993, we have very high quality, very well benchmarked analysis that shows that it's actually works and it's better than what we're doing now from a, a dra uh, you know a aero propulsive total integrated drag standpoint and enough to where i believe it it's big but the problem is covid hit budgets dried up uh you know pratt is the, the rumors are that they're going to be laying people off and having an at will contractor working while real crap people were being laid off, just the optics were really bad. Well, hopefully, uh, I'm sorry to hear that, Andy. Hopefully, um, you know, once once we uh, once we get past COVID and hopefully things turn around for the industry, maybe they'll be able to pick it back up and continue looking at it with you. 
Oh, I I know they want to. It's just you know the way things are right now. It's it's hard to justify something that has a payoff decades from now uh, when they're really hurting now. Understand. Well, that's I think takes us to the end of the time, Andy. Thanks a lot for um, pulling together this this presentation on on somewhat short notice. I know this wasn't uh, exactly how we planned to do it, but I really think it's it's great to see this and. You've done some uh, beautiful work here. So thanks a lot, Andy. Yeah, thank you so much.